activists in Toronto. I used to work for the Canadian Auto Workers, and uh, I'm currently teaching at, at McMaster in labor studies. And uh, I want to hear. I want to. Uh, you're here to hear Kamosi Woodard. And Kamosi is a scholar, activist, writer, facilitator, mentor, organizer, broadcaster. He does a lot of things. He has a 14-page resume, which I'm not going to read. That, that, that starts back in high school days in Newark, New Jersey in the 1960s, when he participated in pioneering efforts to create different ur a different urban vision for African Americans and other oppressed people. Uh, that was an era where people didn't do that kind of thing. He proceeded to become a leader in, in a radical nationalist, then socialist, and then a combination of democratic movement in the 1970s. He worked at building a new political and representative vehicles and institutions for African American in the 1970s and 80s. He became a scholar who has written numerous articles and books on both his experience in the Newark effort to build a revolutionary movement and on just about every other aspect of African American liberation struggle. And the interesting thing is in collaboration with just about every activist and scholarly left person from that community uh, from the 1960s <laughs> on. Um, if, if you can think of people from the uh, from that move, the, these series of movements and, and, uh, that took place in the, in, uh, in, the, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and today, uh, Kamosi has corresponded with them, or is engaged with them, or has is, uh, is, is actually worked on, on joint projects with them. Kamosi is currently the Esther Rauschenbusch Professor of History, Public Policy, and Africana Studies at Sarah Lawrence College in Yonkers, New York. And Kamosi's visit to Toronto was initiated in collaboration with uh, longtime friend and colleagues Carl Beveridge and Carol Conde, radical artists that catalog working class struggles. Now, if you wonder why I am introducing Kamosi, because I went to high school with him in the 1960s, and we both went to, we were both from North New Jersey, and we have been friends and correspondents on and off since we re reconnected within our, from within our Maoist organizations in the late 1970s. And we've, we've been in touch since then. Now, given that we're at the sort of the interface today of uh, Black History Month, which ended yesterday, at least on paper, and International Women's Day uh, events, which sort of starts today. Uh, Kamosi will speak on his latest book, Giant Steps, Radical Women in the Black Freedom Struggle. And uh, Dr. Woodard will speak, and after we'll be taking questions and comments after. It's a really rare opportunity to have a conversation. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> I'll sit here and uh, hopefully my talk will start a discussion that we'll have about things that are going on today. Uh, the prime subject of the day is this book that we did, uh, Want to Start a Revolution, Radical Women in the Black Freedom Struggle. It's edited by Dale Gore, whose idea, uh, the title was her idea. Uh, my co Editor Gene Theo Harris, we've done uh, four or five books together. And I got uh, recruited to do this book that I really wasn't ready for in the beginning, but now I'm, I'm, I'm more up to speed. And uh, the basic idea for this particular book, and then I'll go into some of the other work we've been doing leads up to this, is that uh, there's been a new rash. I wrote a book called A Nation Within a Nation, uh, a Midi Baraka. Leroy Jones, the, the, the poet, and uh, what's the name of it? Uh, and Black Power Politics. And uh, 10 years ago, and then a young man dubbed this whole new scholarship Black Power Studies. So that was 10 years ago. So now 10 years ago, we gave an international Black Power Studies uh, symposium, one in New York and one in uh, Port of Spain, Trinidad, last year to look at the 10 years and what had developed. And what had developed uh, is on the one hand very positive in that you know there's a lot of uh, uh, new scholarship and it's very inclusive on the one hand, but on the other hand we saw a disturbing pattern is that with all the new scholarship uh, it looked as if uh, what we call a leading man narrative remained intact, and that even people who knew better were writing as if men, that this was an exclusively male story. And uh, 
the, the first way we dealt with it was we, uh, each anthology we did would have maybe 15 chapters. 60 or 70% would be about women leaders. So we did a book called Freedom North to show that it was a civil rights movement in the North and in the West and in the Midwest that fought against the same kind of Jim Crow that they had in the South. I don't know if you know it, but they had amusement parks in the United States were segregated in the 1950s and 60s and stuff like that. Uh, swimming pools were segregated. You, anybody ever heard of Fred Hampton mm -hmm. in the Black Panther Party Chicago? Fred Hampton arose as a high school activist struggling against segregated swimming pools in his neighborhood. So his, the school is supposed to be integrated, but the swimming pool is segregated. So he emerged as a leader of the NAACP, the conservative group before. He was in the NAACP much longer than he was ever in the Black Panther Party. So there is a Jim Crow North, right? And all the people I interviewed explained they went to segregated theaters when they were children, uh, roller rinks, movie, the whole nine yards. So there's a segregated North. Uh, New York schools are still segregated. We don't have to go into that. So, so we wrote this book called Freedom North. And then the next book we did, Groundwork, we did the same thing. 60 or 70% of the chapters are about women-led local organizers that did the, were the groundwork for the civil rights and the black power movement. So that was one way we were intervening. But then even some of our students began to, we're helping them publish their books. And I'll take one case, who will go unnamed, but we'll go into it. Young man came to me, matter of fact, the guy who dubbed this Black Power Studies, right, came to me when my first book came out and said, I've got a book on Vicki Garvin, who will be the subject of the talk today. And uh, Vicki Garvin had been my tutor when I was 20-something uh, uh, years old. She mentored me and taught me a lot of history of the movement. And I said, oh, we definitely need a book on Vicki Garvin. She was Malcolm X's teacher and on and on, and no one knows who she is. And he said, I want to focus on all these women who fought against the Cold War and fought for civil rights and black liberation and stuff like that. And so we got him a lot of fellowships and he got sponsored. And Sonia Sanchez, the great poet, was one of his mentors, helped him get his agent, literary agent. Book comes out, and lo and behold, there are two little references to Vicki Garvin in the whole book. And once again, Malcolm X is at the center of that. And it bless him. God bless Malcolm X. But the, the, the story begins with a demonstration that was organized by Maya Angelou, the great writer, but this is before that, and Abby Lincoln, the great jazz singer and actress. They organized a demonstration that Malcolm X could not attend. It was a great, it was one of the things that sparked the Black Power Moon. It was a big demonstration at the United Nations against the murder of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo in 1961. The police brutally beat the people. They call it the United Nations riot if you want to look it up. Because the women basically uh, fought the police on the floor. They, they came onto the security. It was the first time people actually came, since it's in New York, people came down from Harlem and took over the Security Council and shook up Adlai Stevenson with the United Nations delegate. And when the police attacked these women, they got attacked back. Matter of fact, one funny story is by uh, Leroy Jones or Mitty Barack is he was, well, his part of the story, he got busted and he had some illegal uh, medication, let's say it that way, <laughs> on his person. And he decided to swallow the pills before he got down to the police station. Uh, so he, did, he was not really present from that point on. But what he saw before he got really ripped up was uh, May Mallory, the police, six police had attacked this woman from Harlem named May Mallory. And his comment is, and they were sorry for it. May Mallory goes on from that demonstration. She had already led a boycott of Harlem segregated schools in the 1950s. So we know about the Little Rock Nine, but she led a movement called the Harlem Nine to desegregate Harlem schools, which was not successful. And then Robert Williams, the great self-defense uh, leader in Monroe, North Carolina, called her down, and she got arrested with Robert Williams, and she served... I think they tried to put her in jail for 10 years in a federal prison. There was a national campaign. Now, all these women whose names I'm mentioning at the time were on the front page of the newspaper. Now, they don't make it in any of these books. Right? So I'll just keep going. So May Mallory from there goes to help. She gets liberated from there. She goes to Africa to help build socialism. And then as many of these women do, she came back to Brooklyn 
and mentored a group of young women who are now writing history of the Black Panther Party and things like that. So all of them end up teaching as, as they become elders. Uh, but anyway, all of that happened, but the way this young man wrote the book, Malcolm X is at the center of, this, of a story that he wasn't even at the demonstration. And when Abby Lincoln and Maya Angelou come in the story, they're the two women who organize the thing, they're serving Malcolm X coffee. So, so Gene, my Gene Theorhaz, who edited these other books with me, said, okay, we gotta drop the book we're working on. We're working on a book called The Jim Crow North, which is an important book. And we gotta write this women's book now. I said, wait a minute, you know, I've been working several years on this Jim Crow North book. Let's write that book first and we'll do the women later, right? But the more we went to these talks and looked at what was going on, she was right, that there is a major problem here. Even with people who know better are stuck on a leading man narrative, even when women are leading, right? And so we said, okay, how can you do that? So one thing... You probably, hopefully, you don't know the days when there was blackface on movies and everything. It was blackface, right? And a whole lot of people who were not black didn't understand what was wrong with blackface. So in the black arts movement, we did whiteface. And we had chess characters and whiteface, and then suddenly everybody who's white understood what it meant to be <laughs> stereotyped like that. And for a long time, there wasn't any blackface. You didn't see, now it's coming back again. We may have to go back to that. So we said, okay, let's do that same exercise with men. Since men seem not to understand how these women feel, let's take them out of the narrative totally and write a book centered on women and have men in the wing or absent totally together and see how they feel. And maybe we can get to a corrective balance later. But right now we need to shock them out of it and go through this exercise. That's, this is how we started it out. And, uh, but lo and behold, it wasn't that hard to do because you started to realize that most of these women were on the front page of newspapers in their time and they cannot find a footnote in most of these books. Okay, let's take uh, the case of Gloria Richardson. Gloria Richardson was another person who influenced Malcolm X to the left. If you ever listen to the message to the grassroots speech, there's only one leader that Malcolm X praises in this, the message to the grassroots speech, and it's Gloria Richardson who was sitting in the front row as he was speaking. Matter of fact, Rosa Parks was there too. This is Rosa Parks on the cover, I'm sorry, smiling at Malcolm X. Rosa Parks in this new biography that Jean Theorhouse is writing said that her hero wasn't Martin Luther King. It was Malcolm X. And we need to know why we don't know that. Right? And Malcolm X, that famous speech he had, the last message, if you ever see that speech of Malcolm X's last message, maybe a few weeks before he was assassinated, it's at a meeting to award Rosa Parks in Detroit. So she was there and got him to sign her program and and everything like that. So Rosa Parks is much more radical than we would know from reading these books. But Gloria Richardson, who was another person who Malcolm turned to when he left the nation of Islam, or even before he left the nation of Islam, I'm sorry, pulled Malcolm to the left and taught him a lot about grassroots organizing and this kind of thing. Gloria Richardson led a thing called the Cambridge Movement in Cambridge, Maryland. That's kind of the upper south in the United States. She was a middle-aged woman and her daughters who were demonstrating to desegregate theaters in Cambridge, Maryland. And when they got arrested, she took the leadership of the movement. And she became notorious because she, didn't, she was not nonviolent. So when the police attacked her community, it was a working class movement, they fought back. And their demands were not totally for it to end desegregation. It was about jobs, better housing, to end police brutality, and more northern kind of urban demands, right? Now, if you were in the United States in 1962, you would have seen Gloria Richardson on the front page of the newspapers, particularly the Washington Post. The Kennedy administration was trying to negotiate with her. The National Guard took over Cambridge for a year, so she had to fight generals. Stokely Carmichael, the famous black power advocate, 
and many of the SNCC people got their training ground in Cambridge. Stokely Carmichael was first gas attack in Cambridge and they learned how to fight the National Guard watching Gloria Richardson lead them. So we gave a conference on uh, women in the Black Revolt and uh, a lot of SNCC veteran women were there. And Gloria Richardson spoke. I had the honor of sitting at the table word and all that stuff like that. She lives in New York now. And the SNCC women said she was our leader. Contrary to all the other things, they say Ella Baker was their leader and stuff like that, but it was really Gloria Richardson, before they got to Mississippi, they were in Cambridge, right? And they learned this, how to do door-to-door -door organizing, how to form a, a, an agenda that relates to the community, and also the complicated work of fighting the police, the National Guard, and white terrorists without getting yourself killed. Now this book that Gene Theorhouse is going to do on Rosa Parks is going to be interesting because Rosa Parks t tells us in all of her stuff, she really, she wasn't in the nonviolence. Right? I mean, one of the first quotes in the book said that she really wasn't in that. Right? That she believed in self-defense. But the way women define self-defense is different sometimes than the way men define self-defense. So let me, let me jump to self-defense because I think that's an important one of these issues. We talk about black power, black militancy. There's a book called Purify. I can mention this book because it's already out there. It's a book called Purify, and I had to review, interview, uh, review the book. Purify is a book about black self-defense in the 1960s, and it claims that self-defense was an all-male enterprise. So I had to review the book, and it, it, it's a nice book in many ways. I mean, it has a legal argument that's correct, et cetera, et cetera. But I had to slam them on this, and actually my negative was longer than the positive, but then they cut the a review in, in part. But I said, now how could you feel you're qualified to write about black history and think that women were not at the center of self-defense? And what happens is, and this is one of the central issues, is we have defined all of these categories imagining men doing the activity. So what we said, well, put women back in the equation and imagine it again, and the very definition changes. Because one of the main issues in self-defense for black women that any fool would know is rape. When we talk about white terror, for most black women, it starts with rape. And I'll tell you, one of the first advocates of self-defense that everybody knows is Harry Tubman. You know what I'm saying? But we can get so hypnotized by the language of this is, a, you know, your theoretical words and stuff like that, and this is what it means, and then women, by the, the way you define it, women can't be part of it. Right? But women have always done self-defense, and they had to. And particularly terror, lynching, stuff like that, rape was right next to terror. A lot of black women were raped before they were lynched. Right? And there's all this sexual ritual they go through when they lynch somebody. Right? So it's very sexualized. So, so it's really... But Harry Tubman was the general. Ida B. Wells. We all know she led the anti-lynching campaign. What is anti-lynching if it's not self-defense? So you see as I'm going along, I'm really elaborating, enriching the concept of self-defense. It's a mass movement to stop terror. Matter of fact, as far as the war on terror, we need to reclaim that. We're the first people to start the war on terror. It was white terror. We started the war on terror. You can't say you started. We've been fighting terror, lynching, mob, genocide for more than 100 years now. I mean, Harriet Tubman was an anti-terrorist fighter. That's slavery was terror. Right? Matter of fact, she says slavery is war. That was Harriet Tubman. Quote, you know, and I get angry uh, with people. I mean, Mao Zedong is a great guy. You know, he was a great guy. Ho Chi Minh was a great guy. But if you want to look at the history of guerrilla warfare, Harry Tubman was a strategic leader of guerrilla warfare before they were born. Right? So, not, so once we look at, we change this definition, the timeline we're looking at changes. Because we came up with a timeline for the dudes, men. And, and I'm, hey, men are okay. I'm a man myself, right? But, but let's be fair about it. 
A lot of these women started long before that, maybe 100 years back. So if we start including that, we come up with a much richer definition of self-defense, guerrilla warfare and all these concepts, and a much richer understanding of what oppression is and what it would mean to liberate ourselves from that. Right? So when we put these women together, let me get to my uh, girl, Vicki Garvin. And your question was, who is Vicki Garvin? And I was doing, a, we were trying to build a group called, well, Herman talked about all the groups I've been. I've been kicked out of more socialist organizations and communist organizations probably. Well, there's another guy who tried to compete with me, but I've been kicked out of them all. So that's why I've been in so many different groups. I would, you know, complain and ask a few questions, and you know, I don't know whether you were in those groups, but if you ask too many questions, they get a hey, hairy eyeball or kick you out, right? So I've been, I asked too many questions, I got kicked out. Uh, and all of them, if they only had one thing in common, is they kick Kamozi out before the, before the night's over. So anyway, so I, I've been I bummed around in a lot of different groups there. I was curious about things. And then I got kicked out of civil rights in, in the black power groups too, so it's all unanimous. But the uh, women's groups took me in, strangely enough, right? So uh, we were building a group in 1980 called the uh, Black United Front. There was a lot of uh, lynchings going on all over the country, there were school fights, and we all wanted to form a united front, uh, so we formed this black united front. So I was going around doing workshops, and I ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, and after I did this workshop on how to build a united front and come to Brooklyn for this national meeting, a friend of mine introduced me to this old woman named Vicki Gardner. And I asked, after she left, as politely as I could, who the hell is Vicki Gardner? And he said to me, haven't you read the autobiography of Malcolm X? And so it embarrassed me. I said, yeah, I read it. So yeah, I know. So then I went and got home and got my copy and looked. And Vicki Garvin is in the back of uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Vicki Garvin is in the section on Ghana. And basically, Maya Angelou, you know, it's a whole different story. Maya Angelou, uh, bless her soul, was a stop-down revolutionary in the 50s and 60s. And you know, a lot of these people have to cover, in order to be successful in America, you have to like lose that part of your resume. I guess I was supposed to lose mine too, that's why I'm not going far in life. But, uh, but a lot of these people were on the left, and that's how, let's be real about it. If you see any actors like Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, or any of those early actors, you couldn't have been a black actor without being on the left because the only actors union that were integrated were the ones on the left. I mean, that's, that's not even, that's not a brain teaser. That's just the reality of the world. We want to know the, the lay of the world. The only integrated actors union were on the left, right? So I don't want to tar anybody or making them lose their job or something like that, but that's what that was, right? That's, that's the history of the United States during the Cold War there. Uh, so anyway, so Vicki, I looked it up. Vicki was with Maya Angelou. Vicki was Maya Angelou's roommate in Ghana. And the title of this book comes from, the, the quote is, when people get to Ghana, they say, oh, you want to start a revolution? Go see Vicki Garvin and Maya Angelou. Mm -hmm. Now, Vicki Garvin and uh, Maya Angelou were dating and talking to uh, Egyptian revolutionaries. So we come back to the Egyptian revolution, but this is in the 1960s. And African liberation leaders were uh, gathering in Ghana, which had been led by Kwame Nkrumah, who was trying a socialist experiment during that period of time. And so, all, so the Accra, the capital, became a place where everyone hung out. And they were trying to figure out the nature of the African Revolution compared to civil rights and black liberation in the United States. But they noticed the CIA was spy, uh, spying on them. So they got a bungalow right next to W.E.B. Du Bois, it's his bungalow, and Shirley Graham Du Bois. So their bungalow is right next to them, and from there they would have all their meetings, and they knew everybody. So when Malcolm got to, uh, made his transition from the uh, Nation of Islam and looked to the left, Vicki Garvin and Maya Angelou were two key people he wanted in to guidance from for both his politics and his organizing. Now, if the, the documents on Malcolm X, there's a Malcolm X Museum now, and if you go to that museum, or Audubon Ballroom where he was assassinated, if you push the screen, one of the first screens you'll see is that Malcolm X, well, this is not on the screen, but I'll tell you this one, then we'll do the screen. When Malcolm X applied for the military, 
he wrote down he was a communist. Now, in some of the uh, mythologized autobiography and other accounts, he says he was wanted to kill all white people. That's an interesting story. But on the piece of paper that we have, it's in the uh, edited book, The FBI Documents of Malcolm X by Claiborne Carson and Spike Lee. It, you'll see the form. It says, I'm a communist. And then on the screen, when you push the museum thing, it says that in his first letters to Elijah Muhammad, he said, I always felt like a communist. Well, Vicki Garvin tried to recruit him into the Communist Party in 1940. And Malcolm went to a number of their meetings. The only thing, Mal Malcolm would listen to all this talk about socialism and stuff like that. When it came time for the recruitment and the, the drinks and stuff like that, he'd put his coat on and leave. And basically his comment was that he thought that the political agitation could be stronger. So he was looking for something that had stronger, who could reach the community he was in. But he, but he was absorbing all the ideas and, and he was carrying that part of his identity for a while. So when he left uh, Elijah Muhammad, he immediately looked for Vicki Garvin, who had been his tutor in communism, and she was in Ghana. So he goes to Ghana, and when he gets to Ghana, and my, I'm sorry, in Maya Angelou, he knew that she was with the, one of the best organizers who could hook him up with Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, because she had been running a lot of that business out of Harlem. So he knew the two people, and plus the guys in his organization in Harlem were messing up the organization. If you read about the mess that was going on in Harlem, the men were really messing up. So he, he went to Ghana to recruit Maya Angelou to run his organization back in Harlem. And Maya Angelou does come back to Harlem, uh, and, but she went to Los Angeles first to see her brother. You could look at that, I think it's in, which, I think it's in the, the volume called Got My Traveling Shoes. That's where she goes into it in some, some detail. And she turns the radio on uh, at her, in Los Angeles and finds out Malcolm's been murdered. And so she changes, she had to change her plan. Matter of fact, she did a, a video broadcast two years ago on Malcolm's birthday. And she said she had just forgiven Malcolm X for, for being killed. So that's how close these people were. She was a revolutionary uh, at that time.